Bannon. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action! Men, women, children. You know, I started Restaurant Fiction a few years ago. And if you listen to the number one episode, I'm not going to lie, besides me, that's a whole other conversation. But I'm just, in terms of the technical stuff, the sound, the editing, the pacing, the music, the overarching overall vibe, Well, there is a big difference of the sound from then to now. And it's changed. It's gotten better. It's gotten a lot more pro, all because of our amazing editor, our amazing sound guru, our amazing creative consultant. And his name is Chris J. Hudson. Now, we don't have a monopoly on Chris's work. We would like to. We would like to just give him a retainer fee and be like, you're just going to be our guy from here on to eternity. But no, he is actually, uh, you know, he is open to the free market. He is a free agent. And if you want your creative project, when it comes to sound, when it comes to editing, when it comes to music to be pro and to the next level, even better than us, because I'm sure he has those capabilities. Well, give him a shout out. His website is Chris jhudsonacting.com mention that you heard of his name and who he is on restaurant fiction i'm sure he'll throw you a bone here and there i don't know what i don't know how much but i'm sure i mean he he loves he loves creatives he loves music he loves editing this is what he does and he is awesome at it all right also While you're listening to Restaurant Fiction, the best way to listen to the Restaurant Fiction podcast, I'm not going to lie, is by eating cheesecake. Not just any cheesecake. And I'm not talking about the 31 flavors of the Cheesecake Factory cheesecake. I'm talking about the original, the original Quasar, the original gangster cheesecake, our original New York cheesecake. And there is only one place that does New York cheesecakes, and that is pretty much the 1919 cheesecake. That's right. This cheesecake comes from a hundred year old recipe. The chefs behind it have traveled the world to perfect this hundred year old recipe. Honestly, it is a tried and true cheesecake. It is the best. It is spongy. It is airy. It is not dense. I mean, you could have a sliver. You could have the whole cake, if you will, the whole 10 inch round cake, if you will. And actually, you'll still feel content. You won't feel bloated. You won't feel stuffed. There'll be a smile on your face. And plus, you'll be listening to an amazing food podcast. You know, it's about the experiences, baby. Anyway, if you want to reach out and get one of these amazing New York cheesecakes, the 1919, it's called the 1919 Cheesecake, reach out to them on Instagram. That's at the 1919 Cheesecake. Okay, that's it for our sponsors today. Let's get to Restaurant Fiction. This is part two with our interview with Simon Majumdar. We are talking about the fictional restaurant, Paradise. Go. In one of your own podcasts, you mentioned all of your beloved movie films. You mentioned Tom Popo. You mentioned Ratatouille. I mean, even in this conversation before we recorded, you mentioned Boiling Point. Uh, But why... Why the big night? I mean, what what has made this one stand the test of time versus the others when I ask, you know, what what fictional restaurant would you like to talk about? You know, it's a film that constantly, when I watch it, I realize I've literally been smiling the whole way through it. And very few things make us do that these days. I love the dialogue. I love the insistence on the film. I love watching their reactions with Minnie Driver and Isabella Rossellini. I love even going into the the kind of American Italian side of it, that restaurant. I I know I want to go there too. And I think we're often very dismissive in the US of American Italian food because we're going now, oh, it's not authentic, it's not this. And yet what I love right now is there's some chefs really summing up 
their love of their Italian American background. Uh, Antonia Lafaso, who we know obviously has been on Tournament of Champions, she has a restaurant near here called Scopa, where she is absolutely embracing Italian American food. What I love is even that side of it, that even they're trying to show it in a slightly diminished light is still great. And I go, I just want to be in that restaurant too, sitting, having a martini and having chicken palm or whatever they were going to have, because I know it would be, you know, fun. And so this whole film makes me smile. And I don't think many food films do that for me. Perhaps Ratatouille might be the only other one because I identify with the critic in that. All right. Well, that, that's a nice, uh, really quick. We're going to go, we're going to jump around then, Simon, if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, all right. So going off the ladder of that answer, you, you said of how uh, you identify with the food critic. So the last scene of Ratatouille is this dish brings the food critic back to his childhood. What is that dish that brings you back to your childhood? <laughs> I think I'm because I can, I'm going to choose two. So one comes from my Indian background, and the recipe is on my website, which is what we call in our family LSD, which isn't LSD, I hasten to add. It's a life-saving dal. It is actually, and I, I tell the story, it's the dish that saved my life. You know, I was literally about to jump off a balcony in my apartment in London, and I started instead, I started smelling food from the apartment below, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and cook first. I was more, I would say I was more hungry than suicidal. So I went to go and cook this dish. It's a red lentil dal from the Bengal part of India, Calcutta. It's our family dish. It's like our chicken soup. It's like our nourishment we have when we have a cold, and it's full of spices and red lentils, and it's absolutely glorious. And that, to me, brings me that kind of Proustian Madeline thing. When I smell it, when I cook it, I can taste it. It brings back incredible memories. And similarly, going on to the kind of British side of my life, you know, I'm a half Indian, half Welsh or, and half British, as it were, person. When I was a kid, Friday nights were fish and chip nights. You went to the fish and chip shop, you brought back the fish and chips wrapped in newspaper or paper, and you sat and ate it off a tray while watching, you know, television with the whole family. And the smell of salt and vinegar on freshly cooked fish and chips, it's something that you, you, you can get fish and chips here in the US and some people make it very well. But that thing of context of having it in Britain from a newspaper, eating it while watching TV and with your family, again, family context. But even now I'm saying it. I, I get the smell. I get the smell of the vinegar on chips. I get the smell of, the, I get the taste of the crunch of the batter. So those are the two meals from my childhood. And, you know, we're planning to go back to England. We haven't been able to go for a few years, obviously, because of the pandemic. We're planning to go back later this year, hopefully. And the first thing I do, I actually said it to my wife yesterday, you know, first thing we're going to do is go and have fish and chips. Excellent. Are you going, um, going back to paradise? If you don't mind putting your uh, restaurant food critic hat on for us, because I know in some of your Instagram pictures, you have a picture of you wearing many hats. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you could put your food critic hat on for us, uh, how would you review Paradise? Oh, well, if I was reviewing it now, I'd be going, it's, it's, it's rather outdated because I think some of the food that they do, as I mentioned earlier, it has been, you know, Italian food doesn't ossify. But what I would be saying is, I love the I love the unfiltered bravery of it. If it was ultra doing food, we'd have to look at some restaurants now, maybe from other cuisines that are coming in that people don't quite know. And so they're looking at it now. If you did a restaurant serving or uh, regional Italian food, you're not going to get too much criticism or not even criticism, too much kind of questioning because people are going to know it. So I think it would be like looking at someone doing very regional Thai food or very regional Filipino food or very regional. So from the other cuisines that have come in. So I think if you look at it from that point of view, I would say that it would be very brave. I would be going, enjoy it while you can, because I'm not sure how long it'll be here, as I mentioned before. I think it would be going, these are the dishes that really represent this. I do a lot of research beforehand and afterwards just going from this area. Try these because you may not get to try them for a while. I would probably say it's, as it, I think it was, about 20 years ahead of its time, probably even 30 years ahead of its time. I think this kind of regionality of Italian food in the United States probably was not until 
the 80s, late 80s even. I mean, that, that's not to say there weren't any, but certainly at this level, it was still very much the the kind of the mammalians. And by the way, you know, I've made the mammalians, uh, what do you call it, lasagna, and it's it's fabulous. So, you know, and I, with, with a friend, we did it at an event where we cooked a meal from each one of the 10 restaurants from this amazing book called 10 Restaurants That Changed America. One of them was the lasagna. And my friend and I, Josh, we kind of made this dish. And it's fantastic. The recipe's all online. So, you know, I don't want to dismiss that Mammalions, but this was, I think, Paradise was ahead of its time. And you would go, well, in another 20, 30 years, you'd probably see lots of these around. Well, you know, you um, you mentioned this book, 10 Restaurants That Changed America. For those uh, foodies out there just who want a good food read, it is an incredible food read. We they One of the restaurants that they cover is Howard Johnson's. It talks about the history of Howard Johnson's, but also that the original owner had, um, like, say, he spent more on food than the son did in Howard Johnson's in terms of food costs. That's a nice segue. That is a part of history. That is a part of food history. Tell us more about this podcast and this food history podcast, if you don't mind. Of course. And and in fact, just to mention 10 Restaurants That Changed America, I actually interviewed in one of my early interviews. So we're on season eight now. I'm currently writing season eight where I'm where you see me sitting now. But in season one, I interviewed Paul Friedman, the, the professor from Yale, for that. And we actually then went with him to create a meal at uh, UCLA. And so we created one, one dish from each of the 10 restaurants. And we did cook the fried clams from Howard Johnson's. So we actually talked about that and we did a video and it's all on my website. You can see it. What was really interesting is we we cooked meals from Pavillon. We cooked meals from Chez Panisse. We cooked a, a salad from Chez Panisse, their goat's cheese salad. We did everything. And yet the thing that everybody loved more than anything was the fried clams from Howard Johnson's. And interestingly enough, again, just talking about it. So just to put it in context. So I decided about nearly three years ago now, that I loved, I love food history and I'm obsessed with it. I love knowing how food fits into our, our character, who we are, how it describes who we are. And so I decided I wanted to start writing about, you know, the history of certain ingredients, the history of certain events, the history of certain people, uh, history of certain dishes. And so I started writing it. We've done, by the time I think season eight is done, we'll have done nearly 80 episodes, which I have to write them all. So it's a bit like writing a book. Each season is a bit like writing a book. So we've done, you know, the history of tea and the history of gin. We've done the we've done the last meal served on the Titanic or the history of caviar. I just did food in films and food in art. And we did biographies of Julia Child and, you know, Graham Kerr and all kinds of people. And interestingly, with what you were saying then, I just interviewed about two weeks ago, Jacques Pepin. Now, Jacques Pepin, of course, is, I think, the great legend, the great educator of, of, of certainly French food in the US. But what people may not know is that after he came over to the US, he was offered a job to go and, I think, cook for Kennedy at the White House, but turned it down because one of the customers at the restaurant where he cooked invited him to come and work to run the kitchens of Howard Johnson. Mr. Howard Johnson invited him. So what people don't know is that a lot of the food that was being served at Howard Johnson's was overseen for a long period of time by Jacques Pepin, which is just an extraordinary story. And so those clams, that everything that we knew, and what he did was he brought a fine dining perspective. And when we talked to him, and people can go listen to this interview when it comes out in April or May or whenever we, we send it out, because I've got a few more interviews to do. Uh, for, so I do a lot of interviews and I do a lot of kind of essay style. But what he wanted to get over was the fact that Howard Johnson's was actually considered a really great place to go and eat because the the amount that they spent on the ingredients, as you said, was really important. So we, we're carrying on. I've just finished writing the history of pasteurization and the history of the microwave, which is a fun one. And so I just keep, I mean, go and have a look. There's lots, that, like I said, nearly 80 episodes will be by the end of the next season. I just love doing it. We don't, I don't do it to make any money. I do it just because I want to create some kind of content that people can listen to over and over again. What, what works really well with it is that I notice now that we get, you know, very nice numbers when we put the episode out. 
But what I love is every month they go up by a few hundred, a few more than a hundred every month because we've got interviews with Alton Brown. We've got interviews with Ken Burns, who owns a restaurant. You know, the great documentary maker, Ken Burns. And he actually owns a restaurant. So we actually flew and sat in his restaurant and we ate there and interviewed Ken Burns. So, yeah, it's 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 my I have to say the podcast is my complete passion. And as much as I love and I do love being on TV and doing all the other things that I do, sitting here at this space researching is is like my happy space. Going on that, so the podcast, you know, it is it is your voice, Simon. It is your authentic voice. If you don't mind, uh, how did you find your voice and how would you describe it? Um, well, I certainly think on the podcast on Eat My Globe, there's um, – I think it comes over much more as me because it's me talking. It's me standing here in front of the you know, microphone I've got in front of me now. But I, I don't know that I ever have found my voice. I, I think anyone who thinks they have is kind of fooling themselves. I'm constantly looking to improve. I'm constantly looking to, to deliver better. I'm constantly looking to express myself better. There are always people who are much, much better than you are. This is true of anybody in life. It doesn't matter how good you are. There's always someone better. And so you're constantly watching. I'm very fortunate. To, you know, I can be on TV with, we were talking about Tournament of Champions, with Guy. And that's Food Television University watching Guy. I mean, he's extraordinary. And I watch him and I go, wow, you know, that's the man who just understands television. It, he just He just does. And so I look at that, and I'm not saying I would ever get to be as good as he is, but I watch certain aspects of what he does and how he chats to people and how he does that. Or I go and watch Alton Brown when I was doing Cutthroat Kitchen with him, and I'm just like, this is food science university for me. I'm just learning. I learn so much. I wouldn't say it to them now, but I mean, you know, I could have always done that for nothing, just to be able to sit and watch these guys work. Don't let them – They. I, this is not a – I'm saying that without prejudice. I still expect to be paid because I've got to live. But what I do is when I'm writing, there's always people. You know, uh, you mentioned earlier with Jonathan Gold. Jonathan, I didn't always agree with his opinions, and, and often I very definitely disagreed with his opinions. But, oh, man, alive, I wish I could write like him. I just don't. I just couldn't. And uh, I try my best. And I hope I have a voice that people enjoy listening to, whether it's on TV and me talking or it's on this podcast or it's on, I'm very much me, but I'm still you know, a man in search of his voice. And I think all writers are, unless, they're, unless they've got a huge ego and think that they've developed, because I certainly haven't. Well, you know, you're, you're telling stories on your podcast. In a way, you're telling stories when you're on television, whether it be on Tournament of Champions, you have to uh, convey to the world, you know, the story of what is being cooked, which is uh, coming out soon. But anyway, what kinds of stories stick with you? To me, and you touched on this earlier, to me, it's all about hospitality. Meals are all about, particularly when we talk about food, it's all about hospitality. Not so much in the reviews, because then you have to be a bit more specific about the dishes. But the, the meals that stay in my mind aren't necessarily the fine dining or the uh, they're meals where I'm encountering someone for the first time and they're using food as a prism to tell me about who they are. I've experienced this in, you know, in Morocco when I've been stuck in a train going across eight hours and people on this little in this little compartment, kind of Harry Potter-esque train compartment, start sharing their food with me because they realize I've forgotten to bring any food on an eight-hour journey and they start sharing incredible food with me and change and and start talking initially in Arabic, which I don't speak, but then into French, which I speak enough of to make a conversation. And because they want me to be included. And so that hospitality of sharing that food with me is, is incredible. And I've experienced that now. You know, I've traveled to dozens of countries and all around the U.S. And I, that's what makes me the happiest. The food isn't incidental because the food has to be good and I will remember a lot of it. But it has to be part of that context of meeting incredibly hospitable people. Uh, and like I said, I've done that. I, I've been to every state in the U.S., and I've experienced meals of that style in just about every place in the U.S. because people are very hospitable here. And I've experienced it across the world. And what it shows you 
I think, is that food food is a prism for understanding the rest of the world. Once you sit and have a meal with someone, I said this earlier about politics, but it could be anybody throughout the world, you realize that, you know, men and women, you know, husbands and wives still worry about their kids wherever you are in the world. You know, boys and girls still wonder whether boys and girls will like them, you know, whatever the situation. The, the, the key things that get us through life are still the same wherever you are. And to me, writing about those experiences is more important than writing, well, the, chick- the skin on the chicken was crispy and this, unless, you're, you know, unless I'm writing a review that particularly needs that. You have to take restaurant fiction on a food tour of LA now in 2022, all expenses paid. Where are you taking restaurant fiction? Oh God! Well, it's a. I think there's a, some good ones out there right now. I what I would want to do of LA is to try and show a mix. So, one of probably my favorite restaurant in LA, and certainly for the last two or three years, is uh, Felix in Abbot Kinney, Evan Funke's pasta place, which feels like a happy space to me. We've probably been there well dozens of times, and we we go there, and I love the people. I, the food is great, and you know he's great. So that would be a, a definite starter. But after that, what I would love to do is to take people around the things that L.A. does that no other city does as well. So, you know, go to Philippe's or Felipe's for a, a, you know, a dip, French dip sandwich, you know, and particularly the lamb and blue cheese, which is a thing of beauty. Uh, or to go out to San Gabriel Valley and just have some of the amazing, you know, the Chinese food that's out there, the handful noodles, all of the things out there. Well, go out to West Covina and have Filipino food. You know, I, I just, I think outside of some of my yeah, Indian cuisine and some of the things I cook, Filipino food is absolutely the most underrated food. I adore Filipino food. I love the country. You know, my wife's Filipino-American, so we we go there quite a lot. I just love the country. I love the people. So I'd want to go to one of the great Filipino restaurants. Unfortunately, my favorite one in LA closed during the pandemic, which was called Mamsa which was up in Sunset Boulevard somewhere. Anyway, food was fantastic. But there are plenty of other great Filipino places now, and there's a big community here. I'd love to go take people. Yeah, and I often do when people come in from out of town. I'll take them on a tour of Koreatown. Yeah, we'll start at the Prince. We might fit in something in between, like go to Taylor's, which is my favorite steakhouse in L.A., which is in Koreatown now, but then we'd end up at going to one of the, the bars till four o'clock in the morning, eating a army soup or something really incredible. And I love that too. So for me, it would be showing all of those areas that you, all of the communities that you bring in to LA that come from all over the world, you know, huge Greek community, Armenian communities, and they all have these incredible markets and they all have restaurants. And I think if you go to these places, uh, that's when you're going to see L.A. at its absolute best. Not so much going to the fine dining or the others. All of those could be great, but I don't think they get to the heart and soul of what L.A. is. All right, Simon, uh, what question am I not asking? I think it's worth saying that if people want to see more of me doing what I do, definitely check in on Tournament of Champions on uh, Food Network and Discovery Channel Plus. Every Sunday, they're going to be seeing me really doing what I do. I'm commentating on the food. For those who don't know Tournament of Champions, let's explain it. To me, it's, it's kind of like, Mar- I'm, I'm trying to say this as if I know what March Madness is, but I don't. But I, I'll, this is how people explain it to me. I don't know anything about American sport. But it's basically East and West, chefs from both sides, 32 chefs for this new season's Tournament Champions 3. They're going to compete against each other. They're going to get down to two final people, and then they're going to cook against each other. What makes this show really different, and I know it's something the guy really thought about, is it's completely blind judging. So the judges will come in who are absolutely the top of top judges. The chefs are incredible, but they don't get to describe their dishes. So I, with my colleague, Justin Warner, I get to write down what the dishes are, chat to the chefs while they're cooking, which is often difficult because it's stressful for them. But we get it, and then we describe it to the judges. And then the judges will judge it based on our description and eating the food in front of them. So it's a really unique cooking competition. So if anyone's looking for something just really different, really new, 
I honestly say it's the, uh, and I will say it now, it's the best cooking competition I've ever been involved in. I think it's incredible. I love doing it. So if people get chance, they should definitely go and watch Tournament of Champions, which by the time this comes out will be a couple of weeks in, but people can go and watch the early episodes and see what we're up to. And that, I mean, from my point of view, yeah, that's it. I, I love talking about this. I love talking about the films you've made me really, I'm obviously going to have to go watch Big Night again. Uh, because it's it's constantly on there. It's what I love about it. It's always on. Yeah, I've got it on. However many different streaming channels, you you have to you have to try really hard to fail to find Big Night on one of your streaming channels if you want to go and watch it. So do go and watch it because it'll be amazing. And you know, you already mentioned season three of Turning of Champions. Where else can people find you? You know, this is now your time to shine. And the uh, <laughs> shout outs you want. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, in terms of chatting to me, although after listening to this, they probably heard far too much of me, but there you go. But uh, you can go on at Simon Majumda on everything. You'll find me on just about everything with at Simon Majumda. I'm even on TikTok where I think I am at the real Simon Majumda. I don't know if somebody, there was someone else on there called Simon Majumda. Seems unlikely, but there you go. Um, and so I it's it's me that answers. So, you know, I I answer all my questions. I always I always try and respond to everyone. I always try, you know, even people who are sometimes a little bit mean, but I try and respond to everyone. And then again, if people are interested in the food history side of it, do go and look out Eat My Globe. As I said, I'm just writing season eight now. We'll go and record that very, very soon. Interviewing, like I said, people like Jacques Pepin, but you can go and listen to all the other interviews and all the other essays as it were my where i talk about we just did some on the history of christmas we did the history of christmas food we did just before christmas was our last season yeah so there's all kinds of interesting things and again we love answering questions on that because food history really informs who we are now yeah the things that we look around whether you you know i notice you've got was it gin and you've got bourbon and you've got stuff behind you and you're you can but gin has the most incredible history it was the crack cocaine of 17th century London. You know, I mean, there's just great stories to be told about food and drink in our, in how, who we are as people. So uh, I love telling those stories. So that's in the end, above everything else, hopefully I'm just a good storyteller. <laughs> Simon, that was wonderful. That was amazing. You are welcome back, sir. Anytime, any movie you want to talk about, any TV show you want to talk about, the floor is yours. Everyone, Simon's available to reach out. I mean, honestly, uh, we were able to reach out. He loves his fans. He loves his admirers. He loves all of his uh, support team. And, you know, the world knows about him. And I hope you know, we're not too late to the game and you're not too late to the game to follow Simon. I mean, honestly, he is all over the Instagram that is at Simon Majumdar. I mean, and you know, it is really him because he has one of those blue checks by his name. I mean, we want a blue check. We are pretty jealous of that, but you know, it's the real deal. When you get the blue check, reach out to him. You know, he'll love to tell you more about his eat my globe podcast in season eight. Love to tell you more about his time on tournament of champions, which is on the food network. You can see him and Justin Warner really do some awesome play by play action. Guy Fieri's tournament of champions on the food network. That's where I met him. It was a blast. I mean, he'll tell you about the books he has authored his travels. He is just an amazing individual and is doing a lot of good work in terms of just, you know, talking to people and building those connections with food. All right. You already know about our awesome music supervisor and our editor, Chris J. Hudson. We thank you. And for us at Restaurant Fiction, my name is Monis Rose. Thank you for listening. If you want to know about more episodes, well, guess what? You found us in the first place. Wherever you found us, just download any others. And if you want to give us a personal shout out, my email is monis at restaurantfiction.com. I really do want one of those blue checks. Anyway, nothing makes sense and nothing never does. Peace. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night.